Welcome to Philosophy Talk, the program that questions everything. Except your intelligence. I'm John Perry. And I'm Ken Taylor. We're coming to you from the studios of 91.7 KALW, local and innovative public radio for San Francisco. We're continuing conversations that began at Philosopher's Corner on the Stanford campus, the same corner where William James used to roam back about 100 years ago. And from there, from that oasis of thought, we migrate to the air via the signals of this lovely station and from the air to the internet via our blog, the blog.philosophytalk.org, where our motto is cogito ergo blogo. I think, therefore, I blog. So start us out, Ken. What, what are your thoughts about pragmatism? Well, the first thing is, you know, that American pragmatism, that's our topic. And the first thing is that there's a kind of double entendre to that because we think of Americans, and I think there's something right about this, as a deeply pragmatic people. We're concerned with results, with getting things done. We're not too hung up on sort of fancy ideology and abstract theories. And pragma- pragmatism, the philosophy, says... Well, right. Be concerned with results, with getting things done. The, the, the truth is what's useful. Your statements aren't meaningful unless they have consequences for action. So there's something deeply right about that, don't you think? That, that connection, that double on Well, I, maybe there was at one time. I'm not sure. We're, it seems to me we're kind of an ideological people these days. But, but the, the, both of these ideas, both of these uses of the term pragmatism have their roots in the Greek word praxis, which means action. And on the philosophical side, uh, Peirce's original idea was, look, uh, to understand the meaning of a thought, the meaning of your ideas, to make your ideas clear, think about what difference their truth makes for action. And that means if you do something, what will the consequences be? So consequences, action, clarifying meaning, those seem to me great ideas of enduring significance from the great philosopher Charles Sanders Peirce. I think you're right. Now, but but uh, William James, another uh, founding father of pragmatism, had a somewhat different thought about prag- about the connection between action and pragmatism. He he thought he thought something like the following. Try to make your beliefs uh, try to believe what's true. That's one edict. And consider another edict. Try to believe what's useful. He thought those were the same edict because being true for him was really just came down to a matter of being useful, of being serviceable for the purpose of inquiry, for the purposes of action. What do you think about conjoining those, equating those two edicts? Believe the true, believe the useful. Well, of course, James was a a much more accomplished writer and publisher and speaker than Peirce, and and maybe sometimes he got carried away. You know, if he's fighting absolutists and then he stomps his foot and he says, well, is it useful to believe it? Does it make any difference? Then it's blarney. It's not true. But really, as a serious philosophy, Peirce was put off by this. He changed the name of his philosophy to pragmaticism, so he'd have something that William James couldn't steal, because... James's idea seems to kind of be based on a confusion between uh, the consequences of something's being true and the consequences of some person's believing it's true, and those can be quite different. Well, that's certainly right, and it may, and if, for example, it may not be that the most useful thing to believe is the truth, and it may be that the thing. Believing the true is not believing the useful, so maybe they come apart. Take Colin Powell at the United Nations. It was very useful for him in not screwing up his speech to believe that there were weapons of mass destruction, but there weren't. Well, look, let's test this uh, this American pragmatism and whether and, and both the philosophy and the American turn of mind. And to help us do that, a roving philosophical reporter, Lin, Lin Gu, who arrived here from China not long ago, files this report. In China, to say someone is a pragmatist is hardly a compliment. The mere mention of pragmatism can easily remind a Chinese ear of money worship, the ends justifying the means, success at any cost, stuff like that. And if you ask a Chinese to use just one word to describe the American character, often their first pick is pragmatic. So, as a philosophical reporter from China, I decided to explore how the notoriously pragmatic Americans themselves define pragmatism. Pragmatism is very similar to the idea of, of going along to, getting, to get along. In order to succeed, you have to kiss the butts of the people who have the money who are deciding policy. A pragmatist is somebody who focuses more on the solution, the product, than the means or the ideals. The more focused on the real world than the ideal world. Well, the aphorism that I've always used to define pragmatism is if it works, use it. Pragmatism comes from the same word as practical, 
and pragmatic decisions usually are convenient, easy, and result in the least um, after effect. It is basically um, being rational and um, just seeing what your options are and, and knowing what is actually going to work and not work in your day-to-day -day life. My understanding is that under pragmatism, uh, one avoids taking big risks. I mean, that's, I think that's the main, I guess you can say, feature of the philosophy of pragmatism. You know, you want to go along with the current axiomatic beliefs in society and kind of systems that are already set up. So, what do you think? Is being pragmatic one of the defining features of the American character? <laughs> no, it should be but it clearly isn't anymore. People do things today for the most insane reasons and because a celebrity told them to, because they saw it on TV, because everyone else is doing it. They just think it's cool. I mean, none of those uh, reasons that I listed are practical or even sensible, and oftentimes they're never logical. I think Mar Americans are pr uh, primarily individualistic, selfish, and um, idiosyncratic, and uh, romantic before they're pragmatic. Uh, politicians and businessmen tend to be pragmatic. The rest of us tend to be a little more impulsive. Yeah, I think Americans are pragmatic. I don't know, we like everything to be pretty cut and dry, I think, and we, we are kind of used to everything being pretty homogenized and we don't have a lot of room to be indecisive or kind of let fate take its course. I spent my first American Thanksgiving in South Carolina with Sue, who was my English teacher in China 14 years ago. On the last night of my visit, at the dinner table, I asked Sue and her daughter and her grandson what pragmatism means to them. Don't get overly excited about anything. Be calm and rational and think about how important is this really in the long run. My grandmother used to have a phrase, she would say, um, most of your worries never happen, which is true. We worry about so many things and most of them don't happen anyway, so that's, don't sweat the small stuff. What's that song, Josh? The be happy, how's that go? <laughs> don't worry, be happy, don't worry, be happy. <laughs> For Philosophy Talk, I'm Lingu. Be happy. Thanks, Lean, for that intriguing report. I'm John Perry, and with me is Ken Taylor. And we're joined by uh, John McDermott. We have a lot of work to do together to educate our audience about uh, pragmatism, from, judge from that clip. He's a distinguished professor of philosophy at Texas A&M University. He's editor of the writings of Dewey, Royce, and James, most recently the 12-volume Correspondence of William James. John, welcome to Philosophy Talk. Thank you very much. John, John Perry here. Uh, right. uh, thanks for joining us. Now, you heard Ken and I kind of stumble around trying to characterize pragmatism, yeah, and then you fine. heard this <laughs> bizarre cacophony of views right. coming from yeah. uh, the public. The, the, the listener is probably more confused about pragmatism now than they were 10 minutes ago. It's time for you to start us down the path <laughs> towards clarity. Give us a couple of, uh, give us a short sketch of some of the big ideas of pragmatism. Well, the, the remarks of the man and woman in the street indicate that the word is pretty dead, right? I mean, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I think what I want to say is that uh, uh, it's an attitude. It's a sensibility. I mean, obviously it has a metaphysics behind it, it has an epistemology behind it. But it's a way, it's a Tao. And basically what it is saying is there's nothing really for sure. And that you have to keep your eye on the ball, so to speak. I mean, Indian head watch. Because consequences lurk everywhere. And uh, most of them are surprises. So that James says that novelty and possibility are ever leaking in, and that life is a muddle and a struggle. And the question is getting through the day and, and making uh, judgments en passant, rather than dealing with a priori's or final uh, systematic positions. Well, I, I want to unravel this a little bit. I'm, I'm not sure I've got quite got, got, it, got it yet. So you said the very last thing you said, you contrasted, rather than dealing with what did you call it? A priori possibilities and conditions? No, well, I mean, uh, what I, w I call it a conceptual schema. And that, you know, we need conceptual schemas uh, to sort of, you know, in indicate going from post to post, so to speak. But they tend to lock us in. 
and they tend to keep us in denial about what's really taking place. And so they're often we're often knocked right off the perch. So it sounds like for you the center of pragmatism is what I think Perch called fallibilism. Never assume that you've got the whole Never. truth or the final truth. Right. Always be subject to revision. Uh, is that uh, fallibilism is uh, an irreducible strand in pragmatism? Uh, how, do, how does the fallibilism relate to the pragma, to the action side of things? Why should, well, why should thinking of meaning as uh, uh, consequences for action lead to fallibilism? Well, the, if, I'm not, if I'm not sure uh, ever, I mean, mm -hmm. if I don't have apodictic certainty to use Kant's term, and then I'm going to be more open to possibilities and that my action will always be significantly tentative. That's a fallibilistic attitude. Uh, rather than if I'm sure, I'm, I have a tendency not to acknowledge the kind of consequences that are staring me in the face. So, so this is sure about the course of the, your future experience, or the future right. course of the world, I guess. Because I guess old-fashioned philosophers like Plato and, and Kant, in a different kind of way, could think, well, you know, I sit in my armchair, and I think really hard, and there are certain kind of fundamental framework truths about the course of the world, the structure of my experience, that I can know for certain just by thinking really hard about them without going out and subjecting my beliefs to the tribunal of experience, as, as Klein, a later philosopher, put it. But you're saying that the pragmatists believe that there's nothing we could achieve by way of anticipating the future course of experience just by sitting in our armchair thinking. Is, is that, do I got you partly well, right? The, that's certainly true, but I wouldn't say that about Kant either. I mean, after all, it's Kant who really founds constructivist epistemology. I mean, it's Kant who tells us that we constitute space and time. And actually, the pragmatists are, uh, as Murray Murphy says, Kant's children. I mean, that, was a, that is the turn. That's the beginning of modernity with Kant. And so experience speaks, um, and uh, you better listen. Uh, and if you don't, there's, there's uh, peril. So that what, what, what James has a line in the pragmatists, pragmatism in which he says experience has a way of uh, boiling over and f you know flooding all our categories and so that there's always an untentativo to everything we do and say so so you see i mean uh, Kant's big work was the crit uh, a critique of pure reason right so you see the uh, pragmatism as continuing the critique of a prioristic philosophy and pure reason. maybe maybe they carry yeah. it further than kant but you see it basically yeah. in in the spirit it's rooted of kant. in kant so yes. what's the difference though between a pragmatist and an empiricist an empiricist says well you know you can't anticipate experience and you should form your you should form your ideas on the basis of experience and your beliefs have to be uh, tested or confirmed or disconfirmed by experience. Why, why aren't the pragmatists just a funny kind of empiricists? Well, um, I'm speaking of James and Dewey now, not Peirce. Um, there's a big difference here in this matter. Um, James, in the uh, stream of thought chapter in the principles, that essay that goes back to 1884, uh, contends that um, there's a stream of thought in which uh, we have affective experiences of even conjunctions, that there are no gaps. And so he criticizes British empiricism uh, for uh, this uh, sort of brick-bat plan of construction, he calls it, contiguity and so on. And he says it's a flow. And so, uh, and Dewey accepts this. I mean, there's uh, the, the seamless on this. So that uh, the empiricism of the, uh, the British empiricist tradition for James is too wooden, and it, and it lacks this kind of uh, affectivity, or what he calls radical empiricism. You'll have to, now, after, yeah. after a short break, you'll have to explain that to me a little bit more. You're listening right. to Philosophy Talk. Right. Our subject today is American pragmatism. Our guest is John McDermott from Texas A&M University. We've been talking about the main tenets of pragmatism and a little bit about who the pragmatists were and why they believed what they believed. In the next segment, we're going to take a critical look at pragmatism. Now, you can join us by calling 1-800-525-9917. That's 1-800-525-9917. Pragmatism, pragmatists, plus your calls and emails when Philosophy Talk continues.
stigmatism Scottish style. The average white band and work to do. This is Philosophy Talk. We've got some work to do explaining pragmatism. I'm John Perry. And I'm Ken Taylor. Our topic today, American pragmatism. Is truth really just a matter of what works and produces agreement? Is there any deep sense in which the philosophy of pragmatism does reflect the character of the American mind and the nature of American culture? Tell us what you think. We're eager to hear what you think. The toll-free number is 1-800-525-9917. That's 1-800-525-9917. And you can email us at comments at philosophytalk.org. Our guest is John McDermott from Texas A&M uh, University. John, let, let's distinguish two claims I want to get us a little deeper into this. Here's the first claim. It's often instrumentally useful to believe the truth. I mean, believing the truth gets you goodies. Claim two, being true is nothing but being instrumentally useful, right? So James, at least, seemed to think those were kind of the same directive. Believe the true, believe the uh, instrumentally useful. Don't you think that second claim, that claim of James, is is, is crazy? And what could lead somebody to think something like that? Well, uh, I I think it's it's badly uh, phrased. I don't think it's crazy. Supposing you substitute work for the word useful. Okay. And the word work is a sacred word in American culture. And so uh, I go back far enough that if my front wheel of my bicycle was off, I would sit in front of it and true it. Mm-hmm. I mean, we, we call it truing your wheel. So you turn the uh, uh, lock nuts on each side. And uh, if you got on and you hit another curb or something, you'd have to go off and do it again. Same thing with a carburetor and uh, timing gear on you know, the old cars. And w- what that means is getting the flow right hooked up with the event. And uh, the word useful is not, it, it has too much of a pedestrian ring to it. So I think you're right, you know, pointing to that. Uh, and it's merely meaning that James is after. The question of truth in James is really very complex and a lot of problems in that, uh, as uh, commentators and critics have pointed out. So I, I don't I don't uh, see that distinction there. As, so you, wait a minute. So uh, you in, say. Invidious. So you think uh, I want to go? You said it's really meaning that James is after. That's how uh, John Perry, the other John on this uh, <laughs> uh, right. construed purse, is having pragmatism as as more a theory of meaning than a theory of truth. And you know my my inherited understanding of James is that he agreed about pragmatism as a theory of meaning. But you know you ask the question, you ask the age-old philosophical question: What does it take for something to be true? The old-fashioned philosopher says it corresponds to reality. That means right. there's the idea or the thought on the one hand and the reality out there, and we kind of have to compare them to see if the one corresponds to the other. I took the pragmatist, at least the Jamesian pragmatist, is not I want to go down that road. That the being no. true is something like it's stable under, pre- under, under the pressure of rational inquiry or rational life or something so, like so that. So let me, let me uh, uh, this is John Perry, and it seems to me that what John McDermott was saying uh, it goes something like this, that, that James would reject the whole idea of taking a single proposition or belief and saying, oh, well, look, you could believe it. It might be useful to believe it, but it wouldn't be true. It's more a whole process of bringing the stream of your uh, experience and thought into a, into a useful co- uh, a relationship with the world, world around you, like having the wheel on your bicycle straight. So he might say, oh, yeah, you can find examples like that. But in general, you know, if... If 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 you're if you're kind of truth directed, it's going to be a very useful thing to be. Is that uh, is that more like it? Well, uh, you know the notorious uh, essay "Will to Believe," which is you know <laughs> you know. Very, but uh, let me try this one. You see, I think that James sees uh, ideation or you know thinking and holding and whatever and so on as uh, probes. You know, as as and so uh, if if I am locked up in a conceptual schema. Nothing is going to come to me that is not already expected to be, okay? If I open up, you see, then there is what he calls uh, stuff will happen not yet in my present sight. And, and so it's a question of being open to experience. And it it's also has a deep sense of possibility, which he picks up from Emerson in the American tradition. See, the word pragmatic in the American tradition, you saw the man and woman on the street. Who knows where we go with that? But the word possibility is a much deeper, more profound word. We do, as a culture, believe in possibility. And, of course, the question then is when it goes sour, you see, are we able to acknowledge it going sour, right? I mean, that's Vietnam, that's Iraq, right? Those are bad times for us because we violate our deepest philosophical assumption, namely the lessons of, uh, of uh, possibility. 
So wait a minute. So Th- let me. Does that help? Yeah, I think it helps. So look. So what? Let's think about what's good in the way of believing. What are good beliefs to have? It's a good belief to have when you have that belief and you confront the world. The world doesn't keep saying no, 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 no to you. And moreover, your power and ability to get along and thrive in the world is increased by your having that belief. Is, is I mean, so your example of Vietnam or Iraq, where we have this belief and it's like a ide fixed. And it's right. not responsive to the, right. this unanticipated flow that's forever coming in. That's right. a deeply anti-pragmatic thing, right? Absolutely. Right. Now, yeah. let me give you another example. May I give you another example? Absolutely. Okay. So let's talk about pharmacological <laughs> psychiatry. <laughs> you know, just going to the doc and getting a pill, all right? Now, they call them side effects. They're not side effects. I mean, they're consequences. You see, and and they're built into that little pill that you take. You take a pill. I mean, who knows what happens, right? I mean, instead of dying from what you went in for, you're going to die from this pill. <laughs> you say, well, you're going to be, you know, you're going to be made deathly ill. It's on and on and on. And the inability, for example, to do the proper longitudinal as well as latitudinal kind of research, all of this sort of stuff, is, is a nightmare. And if you ask the average physician, he hasn't the slightest idea what the possible upshot, pragmatic upshot, is of this pill he gives you. Uh, witnessed the crisis over Vioxx. Yeah. It's a perfect example, you see, of what I'm talking about. I, I get your point. Let's let some callers in here. We, we'd love to know uh, what you think out there. Uh, the number is 1-800-525-9917. You can call us toll-free and tell us what you think about pragmatism as a philosophy, as a, an approach to uh, understanding the world and living in the world. And our fo- first caller is Andrew in Oakland. Uh, welcome to Philosophy Talk, Andrew. Uh, hi. What's your comment or question? Um, I was uh, wondering about uh, the connection between uh, the, the rebirth of, of pragmatism, especially since World War II, and the uh, 60s discontent with authority, and that uh, that it represents a kind of liberation from, well, I guess in the case of pragmatism, a liberation from a, a pl- tyranny of Platonism, uh, but uh, also that uh, there's a kind of irony that that's Get that this liberation leads to identity groups, with each identity group having sort of its own sense of truth, and so that truth gets gets sort of wrapped up with with the language of particular groups or particular cultures. And uh, well, I was wondering about that. Well, uh, Andrew, that's a nice nice question, uh, rich with possibilities. Uh, John McDermott, you want to uh, you want to well, I I uh, I lived through those sixties with a great deal of intensity, and uh, I would offer that uh, more often than not, there was no pragmatic sensibility at work at all. The thing was just riven with a lot of ideology, mm-hmm. some of which I tend to be sympathetic, of, but others not. But I didn't see pragmatic sensibility. Uh, a B. I think that. Uh, if you want to talk about t- being tied, try the recovery movement. The recovery movement, Alcoholics Anonymous and the rest of them and so on, is a masterpiece, you see, of pragmatic strategy because it deals with, so you got a problem, and then the question is, what steps do you take I mean, to alleviate it, to defend against it, to protect against it, and so on. But but in, there were very few pragmatists at work in the 60s. I, I, uh, I wouldn't I, have I think, that analogy. I think Go what's ahead. behind Andrew's question, though, is, okay. is, is something deep because you say, Believe what's useful, even in this holistic way that John was talking right. about. Useful for what? Useful for our practical life and projects, right? And if we have diverse practical projects, then what? 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 This community of inquirers will sell, settle on as as deeply useful, holistically determined, and what that community of inquirers will settle on as deeply useful, even when holistically ju- determined, may diverge. And there's a kind of deep possible relativism. And I mean, if you j- reject the authority, like, why doesn't all heck break, Luke? You know, if you reject uh, there's any fixed a priori authority of reason that philosophy can discover, why doesn't all heck break loose? Right? When, uh, I mean, for example, our colleague at, at Stanford, Richard Rorty, uh, has a book called The Consequences of Pragmatism. And uh, many people, I don't know exactly how he puts it, but think that relativism, uh, I mean, if, if pragmatism says, you know, give up these e de fixe, or whatever you call them, fixed ideas, these a priori assumptions, and look to experience, and truth has to be grounded in experience, and T- could turn out that experience doesn't ground a single truth. Doesn't that open up the 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 uh, uh, the possibility of relativism? So, isn't there a connection between pragmatism and the kind of relativism we see throughout America today? 
Well, relativism is another word that's got, you know, got to be hopeless to use, but I mean, I'm a cultural epistemological relativist, and so is Rorty, and so is James, and so is Dewey. But what it means fundamentally is that it's a relationalism, you see, that's, that, that's what it means. And so, you know, James says, until, the, until this baker in the cellar has his say, I mean, ethics is not finished. That, that's really what it means. So you think that the, it, relativism, the relativistic consequences of pragmatism, pragmatism are good things. You accept those. You're prepared to live. I'm not, bothered, I'm not you, bothered by that at all. Look, people hang from trees because of absolutism. They don't hang from trees because of relativism. But look, one of, big, one of the big issues in America today that really seems to be defined in, in ways that are hard to bridge is, is the whole issue of abortion. Uh, is there a pragmatist take on that? Is there some way of cutting through the conflicting ideologies that a pragmatist could give us on a fundamental issue like that? I don't that? think there's any question about that. But, you know, I often say to my students, if I got a sandwich board, I'm a moderate on abortion. I mean, anybody going to follow me? Come on. In, a, in other words, the discussion has been the conflict between two absolutes. Right? Let's, yeah, you, let's get, you put your finger on it right yeah, there. This absolute, the absence of the absolute. So the pragmatist rejects the idea that there's a fixed absolute outside us to which we have to... This is part and parcel of their rejection of correspondence theory of truth, right? The correspondence right. theory of truth says there's something out there, and right. our ideas have to match that thing. And we're right. not done until we make our ideas match that thing. But you then the problem right. is, how do we ever determine that our ideas match that thing? The pragmatists say, look on the side of the inquirer. So we're going to inquire, and we're going to reason, and we're going to try to live together, and, some, and we're going to r- arrive at some stable points. Right, so no, nothing's going to overturn them. But that's just a fact about us and our inquiring. And don't ever ask for the absolute. But here's the problem, right? If the absolute is gone and we have these thoroughgoing disagreement, it looks like there's nothing to settle it. There's nothing to say the Nazis are wrong and the anti-Nazis are right. There's just nothing. To, there's nothing outside of us to settle it. And people despair about that. Well, of course it might be, but, but that's simply not so. I mean, Dewey has this wonderful notion of warranted assertability. Of course the Nazis are wrong, and that's shown in history. I mean, yeah, I mean, you know, history speaks. Nature speaks. They're speaking all over the place, you see. And so if the philosophers stopped talking to each other and listened to what's being spoken to them, we'd be in better shape, you see. So I don't buy that uh, line at all. So well, I, m- I must say that still metaphysically, I mean, I think the pragmatist theory of meaning is great, but... Uh, uh, Ultimately, it seems to me that truth, a correspondence theory of truth, explains why believing the truth is so useful. Uh, and, and I can't get away from thinking that, that underlying pragmatism still must be this idea that there is some correspondence between our ideas and the external world. But, Otherwise, why would the actions they lead to but, work so well? But you, the pragmatist will say to you, John Perry, that you're living... You, th- you think the explanation that our beliefs are true because they correspond is no explanation because we don't know what this correspondence consisted. It's no explanation. So you're looking for an explanation, but it's like positing God to explain the universe. It doesn't advance. Well, I don't see why it has to be so absolute as that. I mean, for example, take the proposition there are weapons of mass destruction somewhere in Iraq. Now, that could still turn out to be true. I mean, uh, th- we could still, you know, find some weapons of mass destruction buried in Iraq. I believe uh, Cheney may b- and others may believe that's still going to happen. But... By and large, the fact that the the belief that there are no weapons has proven yeah. useful. We don't waste a lot of time digging them up, and we look to other problems. But why does it prove useful? It proves useful because, as a matter of fact, the realist wants to say there are no weapons. It so doesn't require belief in the absolute or God or anything. Just it requires believe that there are or are not weapons independently of what we believe. Right. Well, let's ask our callers. Do you think that but, truth matters only if there's an absolute that makes our beliefs true, or can truth matter in this uh, this pragmatist way? Ron in uh, Novato's on the line. What do you think, Ron? Well, what I was going to uh, ask is that uh, so much of this in terms of certainty is the difference uh, between pragmatism and the scientific method, and if you could help clarify that. As I've understood it, the scientific method was the reductionist uh, 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 building of hypotheses and then testing them, whereas abduction was this idea that you have some hypothesis that you're constantly testing that the truth is ever evolving. Thanks a lot, Ron. Uh, uh, John McDermott, what do you well, think? Well, Peirce, uh, Peirce is certainly the second one. Uh, and uh, the, the term scientific method, remember that the uh, Peirce, James, and the early Dewey is couched in, uh, in a, uh, uh, a 
a, a culture in which the word science was high, was high dudgeon. I mean, you know, our understanding of science and its n negative characteristics is completely different. So uh, Randall once told me, he said, uh, when Dewey uses a scientific method, he's talking about creative intelligence. Um, and it, he's certainly talking about testing, and so testing the waters and, and that kind of uh, phrasing uh, would be certainly, uh, you know, appropriate. Um, I don't know if that helps our caller. I did want to say that uh, Davidson says the folly of trying to define truth, that's a famous essay. I mean, that even the a analytic philosophers have come to the point uh, where this uh, ca truth, capital T, is, is no longer really what we should be talking about. Right. So it's not as though that the pragmatists, go, go back to John Perry, it's not as though the pragmatists don't like truth. They don't like truth with a capital T. But they think there are many small truths, as it were, many small... Truing, like the, yeah. that's what I said, truing. You right, you know, right. You know, Dewey's fond of present participles. And there's nothing really deeply in common that the truing, the truing truths have in common except, well, they're stable, they're the outcome of rational inquiry and they're stable and we can converge on them at, at the limit of inquiry. And so there's nothing deep in common. There's nothing deeply philosophical to say about... True. Well, I, I, would, I would say to Ron that uh, the scientific method works, and then philosophers have to say, well, why does it work? And pragmatism might be one explanation of why it works, uh, because uh, working is what, you know, what, what truth is all about. But it seems to me the realists can also give an explanation for why the scientific method works. If our ideas correspond to reality, then the actions that those ideas motivate, the experiments and so forth and so on, will will eventually miscarry if the ideas aren't true. So I, I think pragmatism may be really based on the scientific method, but I don't think it's the only point of view that explains the validity but, of the scientific uh, method. You, John, you John McDermott, I'll let you have you, a comeback after that. After you, the break. Recall, you recall this. Oh, I'll go. Do I okay. have to get off? Yeah, just, just one second. I, I, sure. I'm going to alert our callers that after the break, we want to take more of your calls. 1-800-525-9917. Right. You're listening to Philosophy Talk. We're discussing American pragmatism with John McDermott from Texas A&M University. We've been discussing the pros and cons of pragmatism, its theory of truth, its epistemology, and a bit about its cultural significance. In our next segment, we'll see if there's any lasting relevance and significance to pragmatism. Pragmatism and contemporary culture, plus more of your calls and emails when Philosophy Talk continues. A time study man and a time study man can't waste time for a time study man to waste time is a crime so I'm ruled by the tick tick tock and I live my life by the clock I live my life by the tick a tick tock of the clock Think of the time I save from the Broadway musical The Pajama Game. I'm John Perry. This is Philosophy Talk, the program that questions everything. Except your intelligence. I'm Ken Taylor. We're discussing American pragmatism. We'd love to know your thoughts on the subject. Do you think truth is what works, or do you believe in the correspondence theory of truth? Here's a truth. You can join us by calling toll-free at 1-800-525-9917. That's 1-800-525-9917. And you can email us, comments at philosophytalk.org. We're discussing American pragmatism <coughs> with John McDermott from Texas A&M University. John, I want to ask you about pragmatism and contemporary culture. And I want to, you mentioned, we've mentioned Dick Rorty in the past. He thinks pragmatism is a profound thing and that it, and that it should herald the initiation 
the, inter- the, the beginning of what he calls a post-philosophical culture because pragmatism, pragmatism teaches us to give up the search for sort of grounding absolute, not just in the, not just everywhere in ethics. We don't look to God or the commandments of reason or something, something external to us to ground any cultural formation. I mean, what, what do you think about that? You think he's well, right? Well, I, I'm, I, uh, I'm halfway with Rudy. Uh, I, I myself hold that a canopy of ultimate explanation is, is a highly negative position to have. And so there I, sh- I share that with Rudy. But Rudy also has a deep, deep, uh, I don't know, uh, irritation with what we used to call metaphysics. So that the bedding underneath this material we're discussing today, James's radical <coughs> empiricism, Dewey's experience in nature, Whitehead's process of reality, uh, Rudy dismisses. And so I'm, I'm not with him on that. And the other thing is that I think that Rorty seems to think that when you uh, uh, sort of uh, dismiss these more grandiose philosophical uh, conceptual structures and so on, that that's the end of philosophy, and I don't think so. Well, he thinks that's the end and, of philosophy and you with said, a capital you, P. Yeah, well, but you see, the thing is that, uh, you said before, someone, one of you said that it's, this is not very profound, or you know, using terms like works. Or something. But you see, I, I, I think really that common language uh, is, uh, it, is, is, the, is the seed time of the republic. In other words, it's, that's the way in which we can have the deepest of all philosophical understandings and sensibility. So, but, but I still want to know, what do you think our culture would look like so pragmatism is cultural criticism. What do you think our culture would look like if we gave up entirely the search for absolutes in ethics, in science, in politics? I mean, what would it look? Wouldn't it well, just? Why wouldn't it just be kind of anything goes relativism? Anything that that this community finds a stable basis for a shared life goes. And if this community finds something different as a stable basis for a shared life, that's fine. And well, there's no criticism. But why does, why does everything go have to follow from that? I mean, how about show me? In other words, why is it that we have to, why, why don't we have to pay dues on what we believe? Um, in other words, elaborate, so it, elaborate. Yeah. I think that's well, a good well, well, you, you, you go from the position of giving up, you say, uh, canonical positions, or what Dewey calls eulogistic predicates, and then you say anything goes. How do we get to anything goes? I mean, obviously the whole community is totally fractured. Uh, why can't we have, I mean, en passant, you see, uh, you know, ways in which uh, uh, people have to uh, make adjustments, adaptations, right. give, you know, so, get, so, and so on. I, I don't understand why you go from one kind of absolute to another one. So pl- pluralism, pluralism doesn't necessarily mean everythingism. I mean, it may be that there's all kinds of sets of beliefs that no community finds useful to adopt. Uh, I mean, it has uh, to do with the sacred word in American life called consensus, you know. Right. Sometimes I lose, sometimes I win, you know. And uh, But neither anything goes, or the other hand, is there any ideology that's coming down to me, you know, from on high? 1-800-525-9917. 1-800-525-9917. We've got a whole lineup of callers here. G- Gerard in San Francisco, what's your comment or question? Welcome to Philosophy Talk. Are you there, Gerard? I seem not to have Gerard anymore. Uh, I'm, here, I'm right here. Hello? Okay, there you are. Oh, yeah. No, my question was uh, I was interested in the connection between pragmatism and practice and the connection also between what we're talking about, uh, about a search for absolutes and also a kind of a the connection between absolutes and universals. So the people who deny the, that absolutes are possible also deny that universals are possible. And this question comes from the idea that, you know, of practice, like, like what can we actually do? I mean, and don't we need some kind of agreed-upon version of reality in order to contest and counter uh, what we are not satisfied with about, about what exists in the world? I mean, can we reject universals that way? Oh, uh, you're right. Thanks. Uh, John McDermott, what do you think? Well, uh, Peirce, uh, there's a big difference between Peirce on the one and James doing the other. Peirce believes in what he calls generals, and that's uh, his word for universals. And he's basically a scotistic realist uh, from the medieval period. And so I regard Peirce as a very conservative kind of thinker. Uh, James and Dewey do not. I mean, they, they believe that everything is basically ad hoc and that it has to submit itself to the crucible of experience. Uh, so there's a difference on, uh, on that issue. Peirce, right, believed that truth is what uh, works at the limit of inquiry, and he thought that there would be convergence among all rational yes. inquiries at the limit of inquiry. So in a way, he kind of pr- brings back you know, what the correspondence theorist was getting at without going to correspondence theorists. Is that and and lace, lace with fatalism. Yeah, okay. right. Yeah, that's different. But he, he, uh, he has this really marvelous notion of the community of inquiry. 
And so there's a tension in purse between his fallibilism and between his deep confidence, you know, in science, uh, you know, down the road, so to speak. Yeah. But, but getting back to something else, you know, the, the, the string theory, which is, you know, is at the center now. And if you notice that big essay on string theory a couple of months ago and so on, and at the end it said simply, until there is some kind of experimental verification, it's basically that's what it is. Okay, so that's what we were talking about before. Right. Uh, Norm in Redwood City is on the line. Welcome to Philosophy Talk, Norm. Hi, you may have just answered my question, but I, I think in I, pragmatism as doing what seems practical at the time, and I had a friend that all his life professed not to believe in God, but then when he thought he was going to die, started praying to God, and it, I wonder if that's pragmatism or cowardice or hedging your bet. Yeah, think, uh, th thanks a lot. Now, go, think about it this way again, uh, uh, John McDermott. So there's a crude kind of pragmatism is, that would say, believe what's useful. If there's a practical benefit for your, uh, to your believing that, then, right. well, believe it. But, you know, doesn't that, like, license self willful self-deception and all kinds and there, of... And, yeah, and, then, and therefore it's not a practical benefit. I mean, if this fellow wants to take com uh, communion at his deathbed like Voltaire, he's destroyed his spiritual life. You see? So what benefit is that? <laughs> why, 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 why? I don't quite... T take me through that. Well, well, why? Well, well you, I mean... You I mean, it enables that... him to go out feeling better, right? He's got no more long-run consequences, and it would... It's better to go out feeling better than to go out in despair, isn't it? I mean, especially if but, but do you do you really think that he made that turn without some kind of, uh, you know, inner edge and a feeling of disloyalty to, his, to, to the commitments of his life? Do you really think so? Well, I don't I mean, know. He's, have to he's do not a, a mannequin. Bit. He's not a mannequin. I mean, he's a human being. He has a commitment all his life, and then in the end, he gets scared, so he makes a change. You don't think he has the experience of disloyalty from inside his own? So person? well, he's he he. Well, I, I'll play devil's, devil's advocate and see okay. see what you want to say. He he is constantly becoming. So who he will be at any given moment is not determined by what he was. I mean, if you're a pragmatist, right? Why should you be a prisoner of the past self and the past? Episodes of believing what was uh, what was useful for your life up till now. Now, if we're talking about looking forward, the future consequences, why not? But what, I mean, why is pragmatism suddenly saddled with uh, with uh, d d denying one's own history? I mean, or the history of whatever one is doing. What makes one? is the history there? What makes it one's own? What makes it one's well, own? I mean, to which one must every bow? every every human being is his or her history. And uh, you can you can deny that, but I mean it's it's a, that's a struggle inside of your own you know self, so th th that could be called the sort of a late blooming Pascalian wager. And and neither, neither James Dewey, of course, would have no patience with this at all. And of James course. would certainly say that that's fake. Yeah, John, yeah. John we've got and a does. <laughs> we've got a we've got an email question from a third John, John in Berkeley. Uh, he says Dewey seems in human nature and conduct to be down on utopian hopes. He argues that human desires arise out of dis disequilibria and satisfactions of the desires yields new disequilibria and new desires. Right. Comment. So, and let me follow up on that. Does a can a pragmatist have a conception of utopia of what what the world or the nation would be like if we got everything settled and lived by pragmatic ideals? Does that even make sense? I. I think this is a very important question, and the answer is no, I think. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that Dewey's a <coughs> pragmatic naturalist, philosophical naturalist, as I am, and there's a price to be paid for that. It's never going to work out. It's just not going to work out. And so, therefore, you have this tremendous tension, you see, which could generate a sense of depression. On the other hand, this liberation, the, the absolutely sacred character of what I'm doing. Right now, I'm talking to you folks, okay? This is the meaning of my world at this time. And, and you build, and it comes down. You build, and it comes down, and so on. It's what we call the sacred character of the diurnal, of the everyday. And that's, that's a deep spiritual commitment. It's difficult, but there ain't no utopia. But, uh, John, you know, uh, the Sartrean existentialist in me, of which there right. is a trace, says that you've got another absolute going. You've got the self and its past to which we are owe absolute allegiance or something in the construction of our future future narrative. But why does the why does the past of m my past as a historical thing? Why is it any more co command any more than any other absolute? You've got the absolute sort of commandment of the self and my history going well but 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 it's it it's actually the history of my experience i mean it's an undergoing at all times i don't know why you use the word absolute a and b i mean it's constantly it's constantly shifting so that experiences that i have already had 
take on a radical kind of transformation with experiences I'm about to have. Yeah. I'm sitting here talking to you. I've done this kind of thing before, and it's all, all that stuff was coming back to me. You know, right. I don't want to make the same mistakes. I hope this goes well. It's not at all. But I'm thinking I don't about, see the absolute I'm here. thinking about <laughs> the deathbed conversion out of mere okay. need, out of a mere need right. that you rejected from the untrue right. to myself. But that makes the right. self this kind of absolute that commands allegiance. Aha. Uh-huh. No, it's just the, the self is the bundle of relations experientially undergone. And I mean, I, look, it's an interesting, qu- important question because I think, am I going to check it out at the end? I ask myself that all the time. Yeah. John, this has yeah. been a great discussion. It's been a pleasure having you. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for joining us. So long. Our guest has been John McDermott, Distinguished Professor of Philosophy from Texas A&M University, editor of the writings of Dewey, Royce, and James, most recently of the 12-volume Correspondence of William James. Uh, we also want to thank the callers and emailers. We didn't get a chance to talk to or read the emails. We had several good ones, but we just ran out of time. So, uh, John, what did we learn today? Well, you know, uh, when I read William James, uh, it's always both frustrating and exhilarating. Uh, the man has deep ideas and a ready way with words, and, and you feel like you're being improved by reading him. But at the same time, from the standards of analytic philosophy, it's it can be a little bit frustrating. Well, and that's true. I have the same. I had a little bit the same feeling uh, 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 talking uh, with with John McDermott. I mean, he's got a very healthy philosophy, and I I want to adopt it and be like him. But at the same time, uh, the old conservative in me keeps saying, well, you know, truth with a capital T, who needs it? But I need truth with a small t to understand how it all works. Well, truth with a small t, I think pragmatists are big fans of that. They just don't think there's anything like what uh, previous philosophers thought of truth with a small t. Truth with a small t is a small bore thing. You know, it comes in pieces and, uh, and, and chunks, and there's no grand justifying scheme there's no absolute uh, already fixed world outside of us oh, you know? i think you i think truth means your ideas correspond to the way things the way the things your ideas are about are but if you think i've that's never a, been persuaded that's not a pretty good formulation if you think that's a deep fact that needs explication and explanation by philosophy that's where the pragmatists would, uh, would disagree well with. i don't think it's a capital d capital f deep fact i just think it's a regular small d small f deep <laughs> well, fact so look uh, this conversation continues on our blog I've, I'm, I'm working up a blog and hopefully by the end of the day I'll, I'll get it on there because i think this is deep and important stuff our, our blog our motto on our blog as always is cogito ergo blog I think, therefore I blog. Well, I'm working on a blog too, Ken, although my blog may be a very pragmatic blog. It may it may only converge to something publishable at the end of time. Uh, but at any rate, uh, this is Philosophy Talk, and you can download podcasts of our program from our website. For the final word on American pragmatism, however, we're going to turn to that most practical of thinkers, Ian Scholes, the 60-second philosopher. Ian Scholes, pragmatism had a huge influence on America in the early 20th century, largely through a misapprehension of it. Pragmatists insisted upon the useful consequences of an idea as a test of its truth, which we absorbed as, if you can't eat it, what good is it? But pragmatism's adherents were more interested in a broader question. How do ideas affect the real world? The most famous were psychology pioneer William James, educator John Dewey, and Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes. James and Holmes were veterans of the Civil War and had seen some awful things which occurred as they saw it as a direct result of strongly held ideas. When ideas become conviction and ideology, these three believed, violence follows. They emphasized the importance of doubt. But there was a fourth, a prickly difficult man, Charles Peirce, who gave pragmatism its name in the 1870s. He took the word from Kant, from the Greek pragma or action. As he put his own spin on the idea, William James gave Peirce full credit in a lecture in 1898. Unlike the famous men who evolved his concept and popularized it, Peirce achieved little success and died broke and embittered. Why? He was born in Massachusetts in 1839, the son of mathematician and astronomer Benjamin Peirce. He attended Harvard, where he first met William James, and got a degree in chemistry from the Lawrence Scientific School. He worked as a physicist with the U.S. Coast and Geodetic Survey. And all the while, he wrote thousands of pages on logic, physics, mathematics, philosophy, and what we now call semiology. But Peirce had issues. While working for the government, he asked his boss to fund a study proving that Isaac Newton was wrong about gravity. I don't think so, said Boss, even though, as Einstein was to prove later, Peirce was right. He was indifferent to bureaucratic procedures and took years to produce reports that normally take months. He may or may not have been involved in a misuse of public funds. He was never accused, but was forced to resign. And his former boss thereafter did everything in his power, secretly, to ensure that Peirce never worked again. He had that effect on people. He didn't get tenure at Harvard because the president hated him. He didn't get tenure at Johns Hopkins because his colleagues thought he was rude, unsocial, and an atheist. He suffered from neuralgia, so he was in constant pain. His biographer claims he was addicted to cocaine, morphine, and ether. 
He divorced his first wife and moved in with his mistress before the divorce was finalized. At one point, he had to go into hiding in New York City because of outstanding warrants for spousal abuse and debt. He also lived beyond his means, investing in a series of ill-fated get-rich-quick schemes. His biographer claims that he also had eight nervous breakdowns between 1876 and 1911. And yet Bertrand Russell called him the greatest American thinker ever. Peirce once wrote, The pragmatist knows that doubt is an art, which has to be acquired with difficulty. Well, he has certainly achieved his own doubts hard by, and it could also be said, judging by the effects of his own actions and his own life, that the father of pragmatism was not himself a very pragmatic man. I gotta go. Ian Shows, the only man who can solve a philosophical problem in 60 seconds. Philosophy Talk is a presentation of Ben Manila Productions and the trustees of Leland Stanford Junior University, copyright 2006. Our executive producer is David Demarest. Special thanks to Devin Strolovich, Neil Van Leeuwen, Ben Temption, and Mark Stone. Our senior consulting producer is Gordon Earle. Support for Philosophy Talk comes from various groups at Stanford University. Also from the Friends of Philosophy Talk and the members of KALW Local Public Radio, San Francisco, where our program originates. The views expressed or misexpressed in this program do not necessarily represent the opinions of Stanford University or of our other funders. The conversation continues on our website, www.philosophytalk.org. I'm John Perry. And I'm Ken Taylor. Thank you for listening. And thank you for thinking.